this on the screen in front of you, what is that? You might know the name of it, you might not. You might have come up with some other name. Oh, I called it thus and so when, I was, when I'm in my garden. Well, my boys and I saw that uh, about two days ago. That's not a picture from me. I, we went and found this online. We find bugs. We find snakes in the church's outhouse. I preach at a little congregation, Liberty Church of Christ, um, out near Mount Chihaw, tallest elevation in the state of Alabama. If you've ever been to or are aware of where Backwoods Christian Camp is, it is more backwoods than backwoods. We are the closest church uh, to Backwoods Christian Camp. You pass it up by about a mile and a half. You turn left, go about a mile and a half. And you turn left one more time, and you are surrounded by trees, and there's the prettiest little old church building. Uh, the Liberty Church of Christ facility meets right there, and it's been there since 1887. I want to begin by talking about movement, and there is a reason for the picture. A movement. We call this the Reformation movement. We're also familiar with the Restoration movement. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to see something. Be watching real fast. Did you see me move? No, I didn't move. But the thing is, sometimes we have this impression that movement should be instantaneous, that there is no shifting of positions, that we don't, we don't look to the Word of God and our analysis is not long, long term, it is not progressive, it is not ongoing, that it's supposed to happen like that. And that is a scary thing as a preacher. It's a scary thing as a Christian to think that movement was what you just saw. I went from one state of being to another state of being, and you did not witness it with, my, uh, with your eyes at all. The Reformation movement and the Restoration movement are called movements because it took time and thinking and debate and discourse to arrive at conclusions and then to arrive at new conclusions and then to arrive at new conclusions because we were not born with it. God did not give me an inherent understanding of the scriptures. It required me to search them. It requires me daily to read them and to consider what I believe and to change what I believe incrementally or in larger portions as I see it as necessary, when I start drifting away, as the Hebrews writer says, we should not drift from them or let them slip. When I start drifting away and I catch myself doing that, oftentimes it's not to the purview or noticing of anybody else around me. My wife doesn't even often notice it, but I noticed it. And I teach myself again and I read and meditate in the scriptures and I fix myself on that teaching, on that belief, on that sinful behavior, on that sinful thought, and through my meditation on the scriptures, not in one moment of time when all of a sudden I said, you know what, I shouldn't believe that. Okay, I don't believe that. That's not the way our minds work. And God knows that. He made us. A movement takes time. That is why on the front of your book it says 1500 to 1700. That is why today you've heard already a couple or a few different lessons that are all hinged around two small countries in Europe. You have Germany, you got Switzerland. And the profound impact that a movement that took place over a long period of time, and some of it actually was over really short periods of time, but you get the idea that even to this day on every continent virtually, You've got all of these various denominations, Protestant churches, as well as the Catholic Church, in existence in all of them. That is a pro, pretty profound influence of, a, of an, an intellectual, you know, theologic period of time movement that took place in just this small little region of the world. It reminds us a lot of Israel, doesn't it? to some extent, and I don't mean in terms of, com I'm not comparing truth and, and error, I'm not, I'm not doing that, but in terms of influence, it is pretty profound to consider that small geographical landscape of 
Israel and its influence on the church today and its spread of early Christianity and then also of the reformation of the Catholic Church. With that said, what about this beetle? A movement. My kids spotted this. My wife told me, by the way, if you're a teacher uh, and your wife works during the day, she thinks you do nothing all day long, every day. So I get 10,000 texts, I get 10,000 emails, uh, not emails, phone calls, and it's, it's really from one task to the next. And we're not just talking household chores, we're talking about just uh, anything and everything under the sun, plus the other duties that I have uh, in addition to this. And if she's watching on Facebook, hi, honey. So you've got my wife calling me, and um, anyway, one of the responsibilities I have is to make sure the kids, the swings still look good, you know, during the day, because you never know what could happen by the, end, uh, by the end of the day when they're at practice or at a game. All of a sudden, if dad didn't work with them, then they might not be prepared. My boys, my, my wife told me, make a, put the roast that she bought into the crock pot. I can handle that. <laughs> crock pot broke. <laughs> I didn't handle that too well. So, so she gets home, we bought another crock pot, she puts it in, timer goes up. End of the story, it's eight o'clock at night, we went somewhere else, she comes back, the roast never really cooked, like it, it cooked halfway through. So I don't like the, the nasty things that come to my trash can when, when you put raw meat in it, so I took it out to the woods behind our house, I set it back there, and the roast sat there. There's a cat that enjoyed a good amount of that, Two days later, I go out there to, with my boys, and we look. The roast is completely gone. But there are about three dozen of those things. So what did I do? Just like anybody else with a, with a, a smartphone and a few seconds of time, I typed in Google search engine, horseshoe, because I remembered it in my head coming back into the house. It looked like a horseshoe, horseshoe yellow beetle um, decomposer. That's what I typed, because I knew it was all of them were right there where the roast was, but it's not there anymore. And the state of Alabama encyclopedia comes up, gives me one of those images, and I know the name of it is a carrion beetle. Pretty fascinating. Even in the span of five minutes it took for me to figure that out, and my boys to figure that out, there was movement. Now imagine, Take yourself away from the technology of this last week at the Jacksonville congregation during VBS, we had, I'm going to butcher his name, so I apologize, but we had Wissam al Mathawi or something along those lines. He is, a, he is an Arab. Um, he is an Arab. He comes from Iraq in 2001 during the uh, attack on the Twin, twin Towers. Um, he was an Iraqi soldier in Iraq. He was Muslim. He turned from being Muslim to atheist. At the downfall of Saddam Hussein, they had access to the internet. Oh. And it gave him insight into spiritual things. He was able to search the Lord's church. He was able to search Christianity. Of course, he wouldn't just come out and search Church of Christ. But he started searching about Christianity and the Bible and through those opportunities and God's providence and a New Testament that found its way into his hands in, in Baghdad, he, he went from Muslim to atheist to Christian. Fascinating man. And today he is trying to get to a point where he can establish the first, um, the first uh, Arab American um, or yeah, Arab American congregation just south of Detroit, Michigan, where there's a great population. It's, in fact, he said the greatest population of Arabs in any other place in the world is right there. That's fascinating to me. Movement. It took time for him to come to Christianity, and during that time is a whole lot of study, a whole lot of thinking. Movement is what Ulrich Zwingli, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, and we today, every day of our lives, should be participating in movement. Our, our faith should never be stagnant. And if anyone here knows everything about the Bible, well, then you might not need to move so much. But given the fact that that is an impossibility, that anyone knows everything there is to know about an infinite 
revelation that comes from an almighty God, then every day we need to be moving. So Ulrich Zwingli was born in 1484 and he died in 1531. He lived a relatively short life. In modern day Switzerland, you would say, you might say modern day Switzerland, great amount of success. You say very wealthy place as mentioned, Swiss, Swiss watches, they're known for their craftsmanship. Um, they're known for uh, a lot of things. We'll touch on uh, just a, a hint of that here in a second. They're also known for neutrality. This is, a, this is interesting to me. Geneva Convention is um, one indication of its neutrality in times of warfare. Did not take a position in World War I. Did not take a position in World War II. And as a result of that, some would esteem amount of, uh, amount of respect, at least for not taking a position in a, in a, in a day when I suppose just about everybody felt like they had to be on one side or the other. That's kind of rare that not somebody, especially in a region that was, that was right in the thick of it, would, would say that we're not going to take a, a side on either. Now, now I don't want to get too political with that, but I do find that interesting. Today, the Red Cross is based out of Switzerland, probably because of that. The United Nations did not add one of its latest nations, Switzerland, until 2002, much later than most of the other countries that are a part of the UN, because Switzerland wanted to remain as neutral as possible um, uh, for as long as it could. And it's because of that neutrality that in times of war, it's, it's, um, it's brought about the likes of Voltaire and James Joyce and George Byron and even, you might say even, John Calvin. John Calvin was the other guy whose name is most uh, familiar to us in Switzerland. But John Calvin was born in Germany. Well, what got him over there? Persecution. Persecution in Germany. How do you get to Switzerland? Well, if there's a place that seems somewhat neutral where I can maybe get by and be at peace, John Calvin says, Switzerland's the place for me. And so he goes to Switzerland, and that's why we know he had such an incredible impact there. Swiss banks are very familiar to us. Uh, so a great amount of the, of the world's wealth is in Switzerland. And their craftsmanship includes some of the things such as Swiss, Swiss army knives, Swiss watches, chocolates, and, um, and other, other such things, cheeses, and so on. It's a beautiful place. You know that the Swiss Alps are there. Uh, Swiss lakes are there. So beautiful. If, uh, if there were a place that I would like to go overseas, it would definitely be... It would definitely be um, to see those Alps. The, the nation has also been known for being very unified. I find this pretty interesting. So there is a non-official, I guess that's unofficial, uh, slogan that the nation has. And you know what it is? I won't say the Latin, but it is all for one and one for all. The same slogan that the Three Musketeers are known for. This says, as a nation, that they are very unified. Now, I don't know that you could compare the sort of melting pot that America is to Switzerland. But I will say this, they have four national languages, German, French, Romance, and Italian. Four different national languages. I find that pretty interesting. And 26 different cantons. Think of cantons sort of like city-states or Think of them as different uh, sovereign, independently sovereign states that comprise Switzerland. And as Kyle said a little while ago, there, they really, the national government left the idea of separation of church and state or the church's dealings with state, state's dealings with churches up to individual cantons, the individual sovereign parts of the country. And so obviously, Part of this plays into a divided country at one point when you have uh, Catholic cantons and you've got Protestant cantons, and that would eventually lead to Zwingli's death itself, which we'll uh, discuss briefly at some point in the lesson. So to most Americans, Switzerland is known for some pretty remarkable things. And um, we might associate modern Switzerland as representative of its European counterparts, as being godless and wholly secular, but this is not entirely the reality. The Swiss government refers to itself as a Christian nation. 
We battle that every day in our own country, don't we? Would you imagine our national government on, I don't know, whitehouse.gov or us.gov or whatever our national website is, can you imagine the kind of, of um, pushback that our country would get if, if our governors, if our elected officials would put on the nation's website that we're a Christian nation? Whew, that'd be rough. So it's one of those instances where you kind of step back and you thank, thank God for the freedom that is our country and the freedom of religion, which we do have. But then at the same time, we stop looking down our noses at Switzerland and saying, you guys are so godless and secular. When in reality, they still, even to this day, I saw it with my own eyes on the government website right there, considering itself a Christian nation. I find that pretty interesting. I think the number was 85% of the country is either Catholic or Protestant. <clears throat> the Swiss's rise to prosperity might not have happened in a vacuum. It was similar to that of so many other people and nations who openly confessed faith in Jesus Christ. And I just want to throw this out there. I don't know all the ways God takes care of us. And I don't know all the ins and outs of the ways that he has helped nations rise and fall. All I can know is what is revealed in the Bible with the nations that we read of there. And I can surmise that our country has benefited from the providence of God. And I also can surmise that Switzerland, in its modern day wealth and its modern day prosperity, has likewise benefited from past eras, arguably even the present era, of a recognition of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We know that the Bible would support such assertions. Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 33 and verse 12. Both of the, those refer to the blessings that come to people who seek the Lord and the blessings of nations who seek the Lord. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5, though I would add that it would be false teaching to say that, godliness, that great gain itself is godliness because we know even Paul would warn Timothy against that false notion. Just because we are physically blessed does not mean God, God is approving of the way that we are living our lives. Our prosperity alone is not the measuring stick of our righteousness, but our accord and unity with the Word of God is our measuring stick. And that is ultimately what, what this lesson is all about. James 3, verses 3 and 4 emphasizes the use of the mouth, the use of the tongue. He says, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn, um, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. This is in the mix of several verses that are quite negative in connotation about the use of the tongue. So, you know, it's a, it's a small fire that can, that can envelop an entire forest and so on. But in this particular passage, I believe implicitly what, what you can read into that is you control, you can control your body by the way that you speak with your mouth. You can control your body by the way that you direct your tongue. Another passage, David says in Psalm 39 and verses 1 through 3, I said I will take heed in my ways, to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. Okay, well what will you do then? I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence or muted. I held my peace even from good. Do you notice that phrase right there? I was afraid of using my tongue, David says. So much bad can come from the tongue. But I, I took it so far that I even withheld my tongue from good things. And he goes on says, And my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. I have a little activity. And this, this little activity, if I can get, if I can, you see, I, you, you ruined the punchline here. This little activity, you can choose to do this. You, you can choose not to. I'll let you do it based on your own comfort level, okay? Say it quietly. I would like for you to repeat each of these out loud, if you don't mind. Because the mouth 
It's amazing. When you confess Jesus as the Son of God, do you remember that moment? There is a connection between what you think in your head and what comes out of your mouth. When Jerry Shaw led that song a minute, a minute ago, you can't say you did not, you did not, you were not filled with zeal and desire and love and sincerity. Why? Not just because of the way that he was leading that song, because of the way that you were using your mouth as he led that song, right? I love the, I love the, the way that he led that song. That's the way song leaders need to be. Uh, singing out that way, getting everyone else to sing out, and everyone else did such a great job with that. Okay, so say, say some things out loud. Use your mouths for some, some things today. Pensacola is a beautiful place. Good, good. Guyton Mon Montgomery is a nice guy. Now I just sound like I'm trying to brainwash you. I promise you I'm not. I love my Savior. And I've devoted my life to him. Isn't there a difference in just reading those words and saying those words? Jesus Christ is my Lord, and he should be yours too. I was born again when I was baptized for the remission of my sins. I don't just believe what anyone tells me. The Bible's my God. Thank you for this. One more. I like, I'd like to learn about Ulrich Zwingli so I can be a better, more knowledgeable Christian. I needed more sentences on that one. I, I think I needed a, a few more clauses in there. All right, so the point is here, it is one thing for us to sit in our little dark corners of this earth and meet with our congregations in closed doors and pat ourselves on the back. Great job. Great job. I believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus. And then we leave the doors and we enter the not-so-dark corners of the earth where where we're working and we're going to school and we're communicating with people and never from our lips comes anything about Jesus Christ. I think there's a problem with that. And I'm preaching to myself as much as you, you guys, I'm preaching to you guys. One of the best things that hap has happened to me has been teaching in a public school system. To get out of the preacher's office and to start realizing there are people in the world I was weak as a young preacher. When I was working full time, I was not doing all that I needed to do. I thought all I, all I had to do was, was study, prepare for a sermon, preach that sermon, write a bulletin ar article, and go visit some folks in the hospital. But what I did not do and what I was not inspiring other Christians to do by my example was get out there and profess your belief in Jesus Christ. These people... These people, including Ulrich Zwingli, they professed something. At the age of 16, he went to school, got a bachelor's degree, went to three different colleges. Two years later, by the age of 18, he got a master's degree. And by the age of 21, he was preaching in, his, in the first church that he was working in. I was 21 when I well, uh, was preaching at 21. I was not... Yeah, I, I just graduated. I was preaching full-time at 21 years old. I had some changes after I started preaching, too, as many of you did, because you learn things. You discover things about how and why and where and when and all of those types of things in addition to the studying of the Word of God and growing in knowledge of it. So Zwingli was a product of his context. But I, what I mean by this is, he was the son of an influential farmer who also was a chief magistrate in the town of Wildhouse. Remember that chief magistrate stuff because it goes back to Kyle's lesson where he said he wished I would have preached before him. Um, so his uncle is the one who inspired him to go to school and to eventually want to become a priest, become a preacher. And so it's because of his uncle's influence when we can encourage people to go and preach 
Well, we can encourage people to simply be a strong Christian. Um, bivocational preaching. I know several, several of you are in the building. Um, there, is, there is a lot of good that can be done through that. In a day when so many congregations are losing preachers and cannot fill pulpits, the local membership might not be as educated as they need to be, as they need to be. We need preachers who are able to fill those roles in congregations where they are. He's a product of his context. So his uncle was a parish priest. He encouraged him to pursue an extensive education. He had a fortuitous birth during the Renaissance period. What do you mean, what do you mean by that, Cade? I mean, the Renaissance period was all about going back to classic literature, studying the classics, going back and learning ancient Greek, ancient Latin, studying those, knowing those, knowing Aristotle and various philosophers, in addition to reading the Word of God, classic literature that would, had been penned in Greek and, and Latin. Thank you, Renaissance rebirth period, for instilling in many people a desire to be educated, to want to learn, and not just receive something from a parent or a preacher or some magistrate, what I should believe and how I should act. Education is so important in our modern day, and we cannot underestimate the value of it. The Bible supports an academic approach to study and meditation and reflection. Zwingli Zwingli uh, had a humanistic side to him, but this is not modern-day humanism. It's called Renaissance humanism, and what Renaissance humanism was all about was studying the classics of uh, the ancients. And so Zwingli held a position which contrasted those of other reformers. He believed in the salvation of pious heathen. Now, I'm not telling you I agree with this, okay? I'm just telling you he is, he is at this point in his life, he's evaluating, he's thinking, he's pondering what he's been told, and he's trying to form some conclusions for himself. So I, I certainly would not agree with the, what the New Testament teaches and the Bible teaches about people outside of Christ are lost, and unbaptized children of non-Christians also uh, would be saved, he says. Uh, he also believed in the grace beyond the boundaries of the visible church. He believed in the op he believed in opposing selling indulgences. We also would agree with that one. Freedom from priests to marry. And in fact, he did the, just that within a short period of time when he arrived in Zurich. I think that's his second or third work once he arrived in Zurich. And he married. He got married. And of course, he violated Catholic teaching and belief of that day. And they said, you know what? Uh, Mr. Zwingli, you, um, you can't represent us anymore if this is going to be a position which you hold. And, and so from about the 1520 to 23, there was a, a several different disputations, public dissertations where Zwingli stood up before audiences of the local community and he spoke about his beliefs pertaining to God's word. And it was his profound influence his argument that won over local Zurich, and they decided to cut ties with Catholicism. Pretty influential character. I want to go ahead and move on then um, to, secondly, Zwingli's commitment to God, which was a commitment to all. He was committed to learning and observation. This is something I've already addressed. He was also committed to networking, meeting people, knowing people, talking to people, his university experiences introduced him to one whose name we know, Erasmus, Erasmus, and a variety of other scholars uh, who were particularly fond of Renaissance humanism and religion. But Erasmus was one of his most profound influences. While studying in the, in the universities, he became enamored with scripture. Because Erasmus encouraged him to read in the New Testament in Greek, guess what Zwingli did? I love learning. I am a Renaissance humanist. I love learning. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to teach myself the Greek language, just like every one of us would do, right? So he goes back, he learns the, he learns the Greek language, then he reads Erasmus's copy of it. You talk about drive, but younger than the age of, of 21, drive, that is significant desire and zeal. So he also, over time, was encouraged by Erasmus to say, you know, you know what? New Testament's not enough. Greek's not enough. You know what you should also do? Study Hebrew. Zwingli's eyes surely must have gotten like this big around, but he says, you know what? I love learning. 
I'm going to go back and I'm going to learn some Hebrew. So he learned Hebrew so that he could strengthen his understanding of the Old Testament. Now today, today we're satisfied with, with just, you know, reading a verse a day. These, these were the study habits of people who cared to push their faith forward and influence other people. How much do we care about influencing the many, many, many souls around us? I don't believe that this was selfish. I believe that this was for the benefit of others. Philip Schaff commented on obvious personality differences between Zwingli and Luther. Until Zwingli began to, quote, read with interest everything Luther wrote, he didn't know much about him. This is in your notes, by the way, as you could probably infer. In fact, the two would not meet until the Marburg Colloquy, where they would debate over four days the Catholic notions of the Eucharist. This would come about four or five years before his death. This would be around 1527 in, these, in this Marburg Colloquy. But Zwingli, it is said, um, was from the classical and humanistic school of Erasmus, and he was clear-headed, self-possessed, jejune, and sober far removed from the more fanatical Luther, whose sh who Schaff described as having a vehement, natural temperament. If you can get something in terms of evangel evangelistic approaches, if you're to take one or the other, it would seem to me that, that there's something maybe a little both have to offer, but I think there's something to me that he has to offer in the way that he talked to human beings. You don't really understand the ignorance of today's people until you start talking to 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 year olds in a public school setting. Now on one hand it's funny, on the other hand it's very sad. Sometimes I hear Christians have conversations about their expectations of how other people should listen to what they have to say about the Bible but they're completely naive and don't understand the reality of the ignorance, the depth of ignorance that the people in our world have. You begin to mention John Calvin, they're clueless. Martin Luther, they're clueless. Uh, Zwingli, they're clueless. No, oh, they might know the name of Jesus, maybe one of the apostles, but debating some of these things with the more naive and ignorant of today's population it's probably not the direction that we should go, but be good listeners, find out what they need to know, disregard the things they don't need to know, and stick to the Word of God, and teach them those things, and tap into that ripe interest that they have when you begin to present to them knowledge of God's inspired Word. He was committed to everybody. He was also committed to conviction and debate. He was not quick in making rash decisions. He was deliberate and thoughtful in his spiritual choices and interactions, causing people to see him as the most clear-headed and rationalizing among the reformers. I think that's a pretty, pretty uh, good compliment of him. In fact, in an offhanded off compliment in the Marburg Colloquy, Luther says to Zwingli, you have a different spirit. And you can hear him saying that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, probably. You can, you can probably guess the sort of sarcasm with which that might have been said, but it was an offhanded compliment. Zwingli was not as, as um, fanatical. He was not as uh, combative as Luther was by all the things that I have found. When Zwingli debated, reason and passion showed through, not anger and animosity, which conversely was often attributed to Luther. He was also dedicated to he was also dedicated to faith and holiness. Um, throughout his life, his concern seemed focused on correctly understanding the Bible and identifying the true church, leading him to write a book called "Commentary on the True and False Religion." At the end of his relatively short life, he also declared great faith in a confession sent to the disapproving German Emperor King Charles V at, I don't know how to pronounce that, it looks like diet, but D-A, I don't know, of, um, of Augsburg. The Lutherans first addressed the emperor, and then they would let Zwingli speak. And when Zwingli 
spoke, it said that they, would, they, they had them, the Lutherans speak first because they would rather conciliate the Catholics than to appear in league with Zwinglians and Anabaptists. Zwingli's request to present his confession was rejected. The reason best seen in the refutation by John Eck, who accused Zwingli of rooting out faith and religion in Switzerland and causing greater devastation than the Turks, Tartars, and Huns. Now, he was not a welcome cat, even though he maintained a very sober approach with all people. I admire that. I want to also address this, the inspiring compatibility between today's church and Zwingli's reforms. I'm going to have to cut this part short. And to some extent, I regret not being able to discuss this. If you mark in your book, this is where I give you many of his 67 theses, many of his articles of belief, a lot like the 95 theses of Martin Luther, and a lot like the articles which John Calvin would write. If you go through there, I've kind of, I've kind of dispersed what I deem as things which are more agreeable in this section. And then in the next section, I give you more of an abbreviated form of things which are disagreeable uh, with regard to how we view the Bible and the things which he taught. Uh, so in this section, I simply have to allow you to look at that on your own. The inspiring compatibility between today's church and Zwingli's reforms I will say this, the man knew, five, knew how to play five instruments. It's impressive. Um, the fellow I referred to, to earlier, Wissom, um, the, the Muslim convert to Christianity who works near Detroit, he, he showed me this last week video. It was pretty fun. He's a very humorous man. You'll, you'd love to meet him. Yeah, just, a, just oozes with, with joy and, and peace and love. And he has video on his, on his phone of him playing 17 different instruments. Here's me playing this. Here's me playing this. 17 dis different instruments. Amazing. But you know what he doesn't do? Play them in worship. You know what Ulrich Zwingli did? He removed that stuff from worship. But he could play them. He had a talent. I find that pretty significant. I think that's, that's a pretty significant declaration. Something like we use with our mouths. We, we we speak God's word and we back it up with our actions and it is a convicting thing to not just believe, but to say it and to write it down and to share it with others. Again, I'll have to leave more of that for you guys to read. And I apologize for not getting all of that in. The fourth section I titled The, Dis the Disappointing Stalemate of Doctrinal Contradiction. Again, uh, here are some areas, for example, where he believed that uh, uh, a person who is a heathen who has never been familiar with the church, um, does not know how to be saved, doesn't know about Jesus Christ, that that person can be saved in his or her ignorance. And in the Old Testament, you can start digging through the book of Leviticus and you can continue reading on in, into the New Testament and read in Acts chapter 17, the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You know, obviously, ignorance is not an excuse today. God has revealed his will to us. All things that pertain to life and godliness are for us today. So we need to spend every waking moment and encourage others to do the same who have no such desire to learn more about God's word. I have to move to these last thoughts. And I'm going to list them for you. These are not in your notes. But these are things that I thought were important. Zwingli, just like we commit to faithful men to share the things which we have learned, Paul says to Timothy, we also uh, see Z Zwingli doing this. We see him doing it intentionally. We see him doing it incidentally. I've given several takeaways here. I'm going to run through these fast. Don't seek change for change's sake. Do it to draw closer to God. Don't just change to change. Do it to be closer to God. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Keeping traditions might feel right, but it does not necessarily lead to righteousness. It's good to have convictions, and it's good to constantly exercise them through study and cordial discourse. Be convicted. You'll find out you're wrong sometimes, but be convicted. What's lukewarm faith? Spew you out of your mouth. Search the Word of God. Only act by faith. We know that, that um, anything not of faith is sin, but, but be convicted. And then change your convictions as you see that the Word of God contradicts them. If you, if you feel like your attention is not on, not on Jesus, but on images which, by the way, Zwingli 
took out of the church at, at Zurich, no more crosses, took away the statues, pulled them out of there. If you see your focus is on people, like he did with the magistrates, one of, some of those um, theses uh, points, some of his beliefs were actually saying that he did not believe the magistrates should rule over the local church. Here's irony, if there ever were some. After the disputations before the audiences of local people of Zurich, the judges of the town said, wow, he is so knowledgeable. You know what we need to make him? A magistrate. And so Kyle's lesson fit in very well right there. Remember Zwingli, three years after the disputations, Zwingli, the magistrate, gets in a pretty good fight with those folks that were mentioned earlier about the subject of infant baptism, which Zwingli was defending and those other people were rejecting. And he says, you know what? Ain't no place around here for you folks. Go on. So Zwingli, Zwingli, Zwingli. You've got, you've got to be consistent. But folks, remember movement. I, as, as Tom had said, I cannot imagine living during this time. You know what else I can't imagine? Not having been brought up in the church. A lot of us brought up in the church. We know what, we, we've known truth since we're this high. What do you think these reformers experienced? What do you think our neighbors views are? How do you think they see things? Be patient with people. Got a few more. I, I want to mention these. Most people do not go to a church because they've embraced the church's earliest influences. So don't just take this and say, you know, to your, your Baptist friends, your Methodist friends, all these friends, start talking about all this stuff. Most of them don't have a clue. And they don't necessarily have to have a clue. Because, in my opinion, the less they know, the less they need to know about Reformation history. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. All of this lectureship is important because we need to know it. We need to share this when we need to. We need to have it in our minds so we know how to handle people and discuss the Word of God and present it. But not, this isn't what we convert people with. We convert people with Jesus the Christ. We convert people with the Word of God. We convert people with the Gospel. This is just significant for us to know in specific situations where we need to be able to address the origins of man-made doctrines. Proper use of this lectureship book is not to take it to a person of a Protestant church background and say, here, read this. Not, not a good idea. And I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but there are folks who do that. And that's just not the way you teach people with words. You teach people with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Correspondence courses are good in some situations, but there is never a substitute for one-on-one -on -one knowing people and showing them love. You must never expect a person to know these things. The word, key word there is expect. Everybody doesn't need to know all of the, the information of this lectureship, but it's good to know. It's useful to know and handle, handle it aright. Many of today's religious people know nothing about these things, and that's okay because they need to know the Word of God, and that's it. Today's young believers are very interested in Jesus. I see this on a regular basis. I know where they go to church. I know their thoughts about religion. I know that they go to church, but can't tell me one apostle's name. I know that they go to church, but don't know a single book of the Bible. That tells me people are hungry for knowledge, and we're the ones who need to dispense it. Today's young believers are very interested in Jesus, but want nothing, a division, fighting, and vain debate. Many of today's youth do not read the Bible, but are interested in it. They don't hunger for church history. They hunger for God's word. In evangelism, we must discern between the need for a corrective approach and an instructive approach. And I notice I hear said, instructive is the best way to start. Don't just start rebuking somebody. Start teaching them. Assume they want to know things and be a teacher. We don't have to teach everything a Christian isn't to teach what a Christian is. And I've got just a couple more. We should have loving spirits that seek to save and unite others in Christ because that's what Jesus came to do. Positive change takes time. Be patient and work for it. You can be a missionary in your home country. He didn't leave Switzerland. Right there. Right here. Right now, today, Pensacola, Alabama, 
Florida, Tennessee, Indiana, Georgia, Mississippi. You can be a missionary today where you serve. Thank you for your attention.